uh, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, I am introducing Ms. Dinio as the uh, clerk pro tem tonight. Uh, Ms. Famularo is conducting our, our vote for the next hour or so. President Daly. Here. Vice President Hammond. Here. Trustee Clements. Here. Trustee Carr. Here. Trustee Schwartz. Here. Um, okay, so if there's anybody in this room who has not voted and it should be voting, you're excused to go vote. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'll start by just uh, sharing, uh, Peggy and I were invited by Ms. Seidman to speak at her class um, last week, and we spoke about what it means to be on the school board, um, our responsibilities, what makes a good school board member, how you get elected. We also talked about um, the budget, um, and we detailed the budget for them. And those that are eligible to vote will be voting today, um, presumably, presumably have already voted. Um, but it was a really great experience. I thought that it was really great of Ms. Seidman to invite us. It was great for me personally, actually, I don't know how you feel, Peggy, but it was great for me to go through the process of creating the presentation. And, and Dineo helped Peggy and I with that. So much. Um, and so that was really an interesting process to go through the presentation. You know, it's like you, they say you don't know um, what you know until you teach it. And so that was, that was a good, good process for me. To, um, if you have to explain all the budget line items, do you know how to explain it? Do you know what they are? Do you know why you're talking about them? Um, so that was, it was a good process for me as well. And um, the kids asked good questions. I think I had some, um, I had the afternoon classes, so they might have been a little bit more rambunctious than the morning classes. I had a few, um, I had more spirited questions, I think, <laughs> um, according to Ms. Seidman. But um, yeah, I thought it was great. So I'm thanking Ms. Seidman, I think Peggy and Anne for doing it with me, and I think we should do it annually. I think it was a great experience. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, please. I mean, I thought it was, it's interesting is they're like going from, they're graduating from high school, so they're not really quite, I mean, yes, they can vote, but they're just really beginning to enter what it means and understand to enter civic life. And I thought it was a really nice way to talk about like thinking about being an adult and thinking about all the different, you know, organizations and systems and institutions that we interact with. And it was really, it was great. Yeah. It was a highlight yeah. of my week. Yeah. <laughs> Right on. Okay, so um, we're going to go into the superintendent's report. Um, oh, I should also say, so it's 8.03, uh, and the budget, rev budget polls close at 9, so I'm going to scoot out to go close the polls. Um, and then we wait for them to be tallied, and then maybe that's around 9.30, and then we'll share the results with the public here live. Um, and we'll fit our meeting stuff in between all that. Okay, so going into our superintendent's report. Okay, um, we have a number of things to report on tonight. Um, the first is um, we received a question from the PCNR that we responded to. And if anybody has an interest regarding um, some of the concerns or the issues that have been um, shared um, or have been part of our um, situation here in the last couple of months. Um, so if anybody has an interest, please go on to my blog. It's there. You can um, take a look at the question and, and our response. So the second thing, um, we are we sent a letter um, earlier this week or the, at the end of last week regarding a focus group for the potential referendas that may put Okay, thank you. Um, the potential building projects that uh, may be coming um, to us at Haldane, and we, we ask for a group of people who have an interest in knowing um, what's going to happen and helping us decide, a steering committee, to come together 
Um, and if you do have an interest in that, um, please let Linda Dearborn know. We'd like to have as many people as um, have an interest, and we will be talking about uh, what we're going to be doing within the next couple of years as far as potential building projects. Um, so the first meeting will happen this June, and then we'll return in September and October and have additional meetings until we come um, to an understanding of what the focus group would like to recommend to the board. So once again, if you do have an interest, please let Linda Dearborn know um, that you would like to be part of the steering committee and or the focus committee for the upcoming referenda. Um, second, third thing that we're sharing tonight, um, an update on the Haldane Academy at St. Basil's. Um, you've been hearing us talk probably for the last year and a half about what's been happening um, with the Academy and, and St. Basil's. And as you know, we're ending our first year um, with the Academy at St. Basil's. And we are talking in earnest with BOCES and a number of districts about taking the academy program that presently exists and turning it into a BOCES program. So um, a week from Wednesday, a week from tomorrow, we are going to be hosting a luncheon and we're going to have a number of districts that have signed up to join us and they will be coming in to learn a little bit about what the academy is and what it could become. Um, if we have, and we, we know we have a couple of districts that are very interested in partnering, so that would allow us to become a BOCES program. And we would have a planning year next year with conversation from all the superintendents and the PPS directors from the districts that have an interest. And hopefully we'll be able to um, come up with a plan that meets BOCES um, expectations and we'll begin the process as a BOCES program a year from this September. Um, we do know if, if there are, we during our planning year, there will be a request that we stay at St. Basil's and we hope that that happens. And so um, we'll keep you updated as we go through the process. Um, we do know that I think we have nine people at this point that have uh, RSVP that they will be joining us at that point, including BOCES. The James Bond property and I will leave. Thank you, Bowers. Can I just Sure. Ask a, a follow-up for that. So the timeline, just so I'm clear, is that you're having your luncheon next week. Mm -hmm. When do the, the, the schools need to say, yes, we're interested, or no, we're not, by a certain date? Or have they already done that so that you can move into the planning year? Right. And so we've already had, I've, I've introduced the concept and information about the academy at a recent superintendent's meeting. So they've already heard one presentation on it. So from that presentation, they decided if they wanted to come and be part of the discussion that will happen at the luncheon, and then we will be talking about who's going to be joining us at the academy next year after that. Mm -hmm. So it, we're going into full swing um, beyond the luncheon. And then you have a year of planning so yep. that the, if all is going well, the BOCES program wouldn't really be starting till September 2018. Correct. And in between now and then, you're making a request that the R program stays as is, but they could say no to that, in which case we would bring it all here. Is that? If, if that were the case, but I don't believe that's going to happen. I think we're going to be staying at St. Basil's and going through the planning year. Okay. And, and, and the approval to stay at St. Basil's for the year comes from? The state education department. And I said, yeah, okay, that's what I thought. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to make sure I understood that. And for this year in between, it's still only going to be our students, or are you inviting students from the outside? No, there will be other students that will be invited in. And so we may be, we're going to be looking at how, how that, to set that up, but it will still remain a Haldane program during the, the planning year, but there will be students from different districts that will be able to attend. Are we still capped at 12 students, or how is that going to work? Well, that, that still has to be decided. We talked about a preliminary number, and what we've decided on is no more than 20. But we are looking at increasing uh, potential, um, the number of employees. One of the things that we're talking about with another district is bartering services. So we may have teachers from another district that will be joining us. And one of the things that we've been talking about is teaching Chinese. Um, at the academy next year from and there would be somebody that would be coming from a neighboring district um, one of the other things that we're going to be doing is adding a DCI course to the academy so we're going to start moving towards the wall-to-wall -wall PBL and um, depending on what other districts have an interest we'll look and see what happens so this is really going to be a collaborative effort from anybody or any group that does want to be part of the academy 
And we also talked about, um, throughout the year, we've been talking about wanting to make sure that the program is, in fact, saving us money, right? There's this assumption that it is. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, we've said, or you've said that we need to wait kind of towards the end of the year and we can really look at right. how it all worked out. And so, the has already started pulling information together. Yeah, so to maybe sometime in next meeting or in one of the June meetings, or what do you, what's your, what do you think? Okay. Yeah. It's on, on the agenda, um, there's a lot of pieces to it because mm -hmm. we want to compare. We want to compare what was, you know, budgeted, and the changes that were made throughout the year. Right. Um, <coughs> and are you able to split out any startup costs? Oh yes. Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. So, so the the startup costs, the the way that it's formulating, is that there's the startup costs. There's um, what was planned if the academy did not start, what the cost would have been, and then the cost to, to run it, which is you know separate from the startup right. cost. So I want to tease those out. Oh, I see what you're saying. So if we didn't have the academy, what would we have had to pay for these students to go off-site to other schools? So you'll have that number for us as well as Okay, that's great. As well as the number of the, the dollar values of the students that return to us. Great. And there's also another piece there that we're not going to be able to put a quantity on because it's just having students return to their own home district. And um, so that's a part of it that we won't have a monetary value with, but it's, it's an important concept too. Yeah, of course. I would assume actually part of that calculation would also be like transportation, right? I mean, it's. It's not just what it would have cost in tuition, but all th these are students who all had out of district placement. So there's actually probably a variety of different there's, things there's a to lot take of into different parts. I have to take into account if we would have gotten state aid on any of those costs. Right. Yeah. Um, so I'll net that out, and you know anything throughout the year that we added in or saved. So there was a you know. First year, there's a lot of moving parts. And also tuition, we would get tuition from other districts. Mm -hmm. We do have so. uh, we have uh, a student from Garrison that's attending, mm -hmm. and so he's been with us for the year. So there's a t there will be a tuition cost that's coming into us from Garrison but at the consortium rate. From, if we get more from this luncheon. Oh sure. Right. That, mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So does oh, that's that a projection then for next year? Right. But we're told. We're talking right. about what is it cost it this, this year, right? Oh, for this year's course, right. right? But that now, that transitional year, we'll still get tuition if if kids are coming in, and then it goes to both. Like, how does the financials work once the in the transition year, and then once it goes to both? Well, we have to decide because during the transition year, it'll be our decision, and because it'll still be under our governance. But um, the following year, it goes under BOCES. And um, so that will be a discussion with all the superintendents from the districts that are part of it. Um, th that will be a decision that's made. But it will then be um, under the auspices of BOCES as opposed to Haldane. And then we would just pay tuition to BOCES? Or we would have staff that continues there. And so that would be, that would be an in-kind type of situation. Right. So, um, you know, it, it can be many different ways. And, and we're going to have... Um, next year, um, a minimum of two full-time teachers and a teaching assistant that's there. Mm -hmm. So that would be who would continue into the following year. And um, so that those dollar values will also be part of it. And do you drive aid off of, will we drive aid off of anything? We won't drive aid unless, um, you know, I, I don't know which model we're going to use when BOCES is, is involved, mm -hmm. if it, that will generate BOCES aid. Um, I don't anticipate that it's going to trigger any high cost aid from the state because we won't go over the threshold. Um, but, that's you know, there are things that's, that's to be determined. That's like really. A Part year, two two years <laughs> ahead. <laughs> and, and so, just so you know, with the high cost aid too, um, even if we're sending kids out, what are we about forty thousand now? That's it's our right. We have a threshold that we have to um, 
pay a certain amount before it triggers any state so aid, and then there's right a formula. about 40 at this point? It's a, yes, it's in the 40s, the low 40s. Yeah, so we, we won't even, we won't have the ability to drive aid until we actually pay more than that threshold of the, of the low 40s, and then we get, we drive aid only on the portion above that. Hmm. So you would have to send um, a student to a relatively high cost placement in order to drive aid. Thank you. Okay. So, so we have the um, the James Pond property. We have the new uh, subdivision, which I'll send around. And so there are three parcels of the property um, that are now it now is official. And um, actually, you, what I thought when I looked at the property, I, I actually thought that there was it's a little larger than I thought it was going to be the part that we're retaining ownership of. But so there are two um, building lots um, there, and there's a third lot, which is that we're retaining ownership. It's an entrance into James Pond, and it's James Pond in the surrounding area. So you can see um, the new subdivision. So we are almost at the point um, where we're going to schedule the closing, and I think everything has been um, done that needs to be done, and we're, we're moving forward with that. So um, I'm sure the people who are buying it are looking forward to it because they want to start building. What a process. Yeah. Yep. Whew. Yep. Then I. Engineer his local Beatty and Watson. Beatty mm -hmm. and Watson, yep. It's been done through them. Okay, we had a Princeton elm tree that was donated in kind from the Phillipstown Garden Club. Um, and it went in, was it early, last week? Late last week? It went in uh, last Wednesday. Last Wednesday. So we had our kindergartners and one of our teachers is here that came up and uh, took part in the ceremony and I think it's the, the committee that um, donated it to us was hoping that the kids that were up there as the tree was planted will remember it when they're up there walking down into graduation many years from now so they, they saw it as kind of a historic um, shift for this for our community and one of the other things that they also shared is that I guess there's been a it's been difficult to have elm trees in the Cold Spring area because of Dutch elm disease, and now this is resistant to that? Yes, so. the only uh, resistant strain was the one growing in Princeton, and so that's why it's called Princeton elm. So mm -hmm. it is historic to bring elm trees back to the area. So we thank um, the entire Phillipstown Garden Club and Christopher Radko, who's uh, kind of coordinated everything for their time and, and their beautiful tree. So it's up by the high school if you want to take a look. Um, the next is um, the Sheriff's Department. Um, we have been in conversation with um, the, a group of parents that we've had two meetings so far this year, and one of the things that the parents have a real interest in doing is for the, the district to be very succinct in explaining um, that there really is no room for any kind of drug or alcohol behavior on campus. And one of the things that we need to do is be very clear in our expectations and of the behaviors um, for kids um, that are within the Haldane School District. And so one of the things we have been talking about is the potential of, of bringing in drug dogs to the district. And for many years, drug dogs came into the schools. I think for the last few years, and I don't know when the last time they did come. Do you have any idea, Paul, when the last time we had the dogs in? Probably been about 10 years. I think Andy Urban was the principal the last time they came. Okay. And so there's been a request that we kind of rekindle that relationship. Um, we've been in conversation with the Sheriff's Department, and there's a lot of political um, red tape that goes into um, asking for the dogs and receiving the dogs. But I think that we're at the point now that we've been given the green light, and so that will be. Uh, something that we're going to be bringing into the school. So one of the things we want to do is we want to introduce the students to the dogs um, so they understand exactly what that means. And we're looking at the potential of probably at least once this year. Um, and we're, we're talking about potentially corresponding it with one of the required lockdown drills that we're going to be using. And or we have to conduct four, so it's um, we're going to be looking at that that kind of correlation between the two. So we just wanted to talk a little bit about it. I don't know if you have any questions about it. Laura, I know that you've been an active participant in those groups, and if you have any thoughts you'd like to share. So we 
did have the dogs here at Haldane. This isn't anything new. Um, we are also the only school in Putnam County who currently, um, from what we've heard, does not have the dogs. Um, and well, with, the high school, with the high school, yeah. right. <clears throat> so um, I think there's a need. I think we need to um, really send a message that, as we said before, there's no room for um, alcohol or drug abuse on campus, particularly, um, and nowhere else. Would the and dogs be here like, every day or, no. a ran or no, like no. a random? Yeah, it's just it, it would be arranged that we have them come in. Um, they would not be here often. It could be once or twice a year. It could be three times. It could be no times. You know, it depends on what's available. And uh, you, you have to arrange it. It's not even the sheriff's department that provides it. They kind of co co correspond or um, contract with other agencies that have dogs. And so we're not sure exactly where the dogs will be coming from, but they have been able to coordinate it, and they've asked, and we've asked, and they they will provide that for us. So. And is there any cost to the district, or is that no? And maybe this is a, a Deputy Piazza question, but what happens if they find something? Uh, the question again. Sorry. What happens if the dogs? You know, I don't know what they do, if there's a process where they're sniffing a locker and they, oh, they react and you think that they are seeing uh, something or sensing something. You have to go to the... So maybe I can start by just doing a quick, but please, and you can share, like, one of the differences with this, um, when it's done in school, there's a difference between education law and penal law. And so if there is a search, it's done by the school because we have the ability to do that um, if, if that's the case and if the dog hits on it. Um, then there is, so I think that there's an answer about who has jurisdiction. Generally, it's the school district that does it, and then there's a conversation about what happens beyond that with the police. But so you can share beyond that. that. That's correct. So, so there are different aspects of law in play uh, here at the school district. In, in any school district, school law will dictate um, how those searches can happen, under what authority those searches can happen. If evidence is discovered, um, this collected, you know, uh, per sheriff's office policy and procedure, and then we have the conversation with the school district on where we're going to go from there. Um, there could be school consequences. There could be legal consequences. You know, hopefully we don't run into either one of those things, but there are strict protocols for each. And your, the dogs are, are searching the school, or are they searching the kids? The school. The school. Lots so they're not property. sniffing, you know, backpacks necessarily unless they're in a locker. Uh, could they, they wouldn't, there's not a circumstance where they would sniff a person. Um, okay, I guess But I they would that. search property on campus, in the buildings, could be on the property anywhere, vehicles on the property, whatever, whatever the school district decides the scope uh, of the search that they want. So those are all available and... and you know, depending on what kind of resources we can secure. Because, um, again, the sheriff's office uh, has, we have a lot of canines, but not a lot of drug canines. Uh, so we work with other agencies within the region to help uh, support the schools and searches. How they is certainly not the largest school district in the county. Uh, so it would take, you know, maybe less dogs to cover a certain amount of area in a certain amount of time. We don't want to be too you know, obtrusive or intrusive to the school day. There's a lot of factors um, when it comes to that. But but let me be clear: they don't they don't sniff people. They don't sniff students. Uh, that's just not safe. <laughs> and it's it's actually the, the way that they react too, because there's a difference between the way they're trained and drug dogs. They they scratch and go at whatever they find. And then there's also the explosive dogs that when they they're trained they sit very still and for obvious reasons you know so um, it's Bowers, you, could you tell us a little bit about you've had experience with drug dogs in your prior um, districts so maybe you can just tell how it happened there um, what the reactions were well I can tell you that in they the drug dogs predominantly search lockers, and it would be lockers, student lockers. It could be lockers in um, the gym area. Um, we've had situations where um, drug dogs have uh, gone through the parking lot. 
um, and if there was a cons potential concern there. And more than anything, it's, it's not to catch kids. It's to make sure that kids understand that there's just no place in schools for that. And, uh, you know, I know that there have been some concerns that have been shared. And, you know, I've had people ask me if, um, about the potential of drug problems here. And honestly, since I've been in the district, it's not anything that I've seen signs of. But I can tell you that, um, you know, we have students here. We have kids here. They're going to behave like kids. Um, sometimes they'll make mistakes. Hopefully it will never be here. Um, and hopefully if they do make mistakes, we can support them through it. But we want it to be very clear that that is just not something that can be part of our school day. I mean, and it's an interesting thing to think about because it's already clearly the regulations that you don't have drugs on campus. But I do... I do think it's really important that, that a couple of things be made really clear. And I don't know the process that you all have been doing it, but I mean, just sort of generally, like, you know, I'm a real believer that, that we make extraordinarily clear what the limits are for our children, right? That, that that's really, the, and the limit here is their drugs are not to be anywhere on campus. And which I know you're already doing, or but at in, or at any event, whatever the criteria are. But to restate that really clearly and the rationale for why that's the case, it's in the best interest of the health and safety and well-being and education, that there's, there are positive reasons for that. And then I think the other thing is for us just to be very clear that as the community begins to talk about this, that we do really frame this. And I'm just repeating what people are saying, but part of my intention of saying it is the fact that I think we need to continue to say it, that the drugs are here to search the school. They're not here to search the kid, because I, I do think that this is an issue that because of an, a misunderstanding of like what school law is, New York State school law, that, that could become problematic. And so it's just one of those issues where I think how we communicate and talk about it is so important. Like, to be quite honest, I didn't even really understand. Like, I don't want kids to have drugs at the school, right? I mean, I don't want kids to use drugs at all. But the idea of, the first thing that I thought of was like, oh, are we going to be searching kids? And that's where, I, you know, that's where I went. That's not the case. And I, and I just, I guess I'm using myself as an example of how people who don't understand this and don't have the kind of experience that you all have might, might be anxious about it. And so, I mean, and I, yeah. I mean, and I also, the idea that this really came from you know, what's such a major concern in the community, right? It was brought to the school for us to make really clear that this was a concern, an idea that was brought to the school by the community out of this concern because of the, you know, this ongoing problem. And yeah, I'm going on too long, but. No, but I think your point is a good one. That And, and it sounds like that's kind of what you're saying. It's not like you're just going to, um, this isn't a gotcha moment, right. you know, um, and that's an important part of this, that we want to make sure that the students and the parents are reminded of the rules mm -hmm. first, give them a chance to get in line if they're not, before um, any dogs come into the school. It's not like you just want to bring them, oh yeah, well, remember I told you about that in the fall? You know, it's yeah. like we want to remind them, what are the rules? Why are the dogs coming? Be really upfront about it. This isn't a surprise attack. Right. Um, and that's clearly not the intention if everybody course. has come of to course. the um, meetings that we've held. Sure. Um, this clearly is not, oh, we want every kid arrested. That's oh, I, certainly not what we're looking to do. It's a safety issue. We're looking to help the situation. We've been working, actually, Communities That Cares was uh, represented at the table during these discussions. It's a nationwide problem. It's not just at Haldane. It's nationwide. And yeah. we, as a community and as a school community, need to take it serious and do the best that we can right. to make sure that our kids are safe. Yeah, no, yeah. I, am, I am all in favor of communicating really clear, strict guidelines and reminding students of them 
or children on a, I'm a big fan of rules, of consistently held rules, you know, and I, and I think that's, that's all, that's all I'm saying. I don't mean at all to indicate that I think it's malintentioned, but just trying to foresee what some of the concerns might be and wanting to express. And we're a unique district because our campus is K through 12. And yeah. that was one of the concerns that I had initially there was discussion of you don't introduce you the dogs you introduce the dogs and it's tough to not introduce the dogs because of this district that we're in we share buildings we have kindergartners walking around with seniors so it's very difficult to um balance the act but you know my, my understanding of the communities i'm not an expert on communities care but my intellectual understand you know familiarity with it is that it, the message really is that as a community many sectors of the community are coming together to keep kids safe to make to come together and make agreements about what we're going to do and how we're going to prevent these problems from from coming up and so i actually think introducing them to the little kids is actually kind of cool right it's like this is part of an effort to you know, we want to make sure that, that the school is a, a, a safe place and there's nothing here that's bad for kids. I mean, it's actually kind of a nice message to actually have kids grow up with that, like, the community is here to help them be on the right track and that we have clear expectations for what is allowed and what's not. So a couple of additional things. Um, Thank you. When we're talking of just one more question, oh, Paul, yes, I just want to make sure I get the, I have the terminology sure, sure. when and we don't know if it's actually going to be a drug dog, drug dogs that will come in to meet them early or maybe it could be another um, type uh, of again, really depending on the availability of, right. of canines in the area, what kind of support we can we can get. I, I believe we even have canine handlers uh, that have students in the district. So, so we're going to reach out as far as we can just to. Um, I, and I think you really framed it nice there. Just kind of really let the kids understand, you know, not only is it about these drug dogs uh, coming out the campus, but what canines are all about, you know, and, um, how they're used in law enforcement. Officers, am I getting that terminology? What, it, what is the terminology that's used for them there? For, for the, the officer for is the a canine dogs. handler. Yeah. And for the dogs themselves, do they have? Oh, just a canine. Just, just a canine. canine. Okay. Um, so yeah, so so it's it's going to be interesting for the kids to learn, you know, that these animals, these service animals, are sworn members. That they are um, provided for in certain ways. They go home with their officer at the end of the day. A lot of kids ask that question. You know, where does you know where does so and so go at the end of the day? Um, you know, there's a lot of great lessons to be learned here, and it's a tool that. The sheriff's office uses a lot. Again, we have many canines uh, from, uh, we have our brand new arson canine. Um, uh, Sergeant Lombardo just graduated the academy, I think last week with him. Um, drug detection canines, uh, explosive canines. Uh, the areas around here, we have MTA police. They have a, a, a huge contingent of, of canines uh, used on the trains. C canines are service animals that kids are gonna run into, that we're all gonna run into. Um, so it's, it's just another great way to bring, you know, that structure of a community and, and what a community looks like onto campus. And you make a good point because I was just going to say that you go into any airport today and you're going to run into Certainly. a canine today. Absolutely. And, and, and the kids get a big kick out of, you know, they see a, either a Cocker Spaniel or a Labrador. You know, they don't just generally see the German Shepherd or the Malamar anymore. You know, they're, they're seeing different kind of animals. We can help explain to them you know, why this dog would be used for this and why this dog would be used for that. Um, and it, in the high school, I've had a lot of great discussions on the law around the canines. You know, what? why is a canine better than a person when in drug activity? Or what, what do they bring to the table? How can we introduce that as evidence? You know, a, a lot of great conversations about it. So this is just another manifestation of that. Great. Good to go. Thanks. The other thing as well is um, what, this is not the only idea that came out of these meetings. One of the things you're going to begin to hear us talk about is a parent university, and we're looking to put together 
uh, a parent university sometime, probably late October, and we have representatives from this committee that um, will help us decide what's going to be part of that evening, and um, so we'll invite anybody else that has an interest to be part of it. So this meeting, um, that the, the two meetings that we have with the parents this year, it's going to continue into next year, and our first meeting will be the parent university in October. And so is that a point where other parents, like I understand this was a group of parents that came to the school, but the parent university is a way to open this up right. we more We did broadly. open up the second meeting okay. um, to, the, to the, community. the community. It kind of fell on an evening where there was other um, more um, other things, to other things yeah. in town. You can't say more important. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was going there and then I said no, no, no. Um, so we did open it up to the entire community uh -huh. the second time around, um, and we did discuss cool. moving forward. It's more of an education, right. um, I think. That's where we're heading, of how we can help parents as a district and really what our responsibilities here are to educate students, right? Uh -huh. So, But we need to work as a team with the parents at home, the uh -huh. students, and that's what we're looking to do. Right. Good. It's, right. it's, 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 it's good really so nice to hear, you know. I mean, I had heard, you know, that this came from the community and it, it, we were able to really move forward with something, you know. Yeah. Let's get that. <laughs> Yay. That's good. It's good. Okay, so we have a lot of events coming up. Um, this Thursday, we will have our Discovery Night, and our Discovery Night will be different this year than it was last year. Last year, it was more of a celebration of all the new PBL coming into the district. This year, it's going to be smaller, and there's going to be some presentations that will be part of it. Um, we are going to be highlighting um, the areas of our that were really predominant in our second year of our strategic plan and so we'll be starting out with about a, a half an hour of presentations and then um, parents can move from room to room to look at the areas the things that they find of interest and so if people would have an interest we are this will be this Thursday the 18th uh, please join us um, I also would like to know, and I, I'm not sure if the letter went out or not, or if it's going to go, go out tomorrow, but um, we have also made a change, or we're about to make a change, in the date of the senior dinner that was going to be next Wednesday, and it's now going to be next Thursday. And so I guess the letter did yep. go out. So we had um, inadvertently, without looking cross-referencing calendars of different areas, um, we have a, there was a, a celebration or a graduation at BOCES that was happening at the same time as our senior dinner. And we had uh, six or seven kids that were going to be affected and they were gonna have to choose between going to a BOCES graduation or going to a senior dinner. So we were able to work it out with the restaurant. It will be, a, we'll have to move it earlier in the day. It'll start for the students at the start of four o'clock and the parents will come and join us at six. Um, and so um, we just felt it was unfair to ask our seniors to make a choice. So, so that was in, I'm sorry. Oh, I thought Julie, you were saying something about that? No? Oh, okay. Um, it is also going to be the same night as um, our a parent evening that we are going to be offering our parents where we have John Halligan um, coming in that's going to be presenting to our students in the morning. We're going to be inviting parents in, in the evening um, on Ryan's story. And right now we're hearing an awful lot about some of the the things that our teenage preteens and our teens are experiencing um, with all the um, social media issues that are out there, and right now, right now it seems to be too many things that are coming at our kids. And so, um, we are going to be talking about some of the concerns. Um, we did send out a letter. Um, just a short while ago about uh, the Netflix series 13 Reasons Why and some of the things that were associated with that. Um, we're also going to be sending a letter which probably will go out at the end of this week about something that's called the Blue Whale Game that parents should be very aware, aware of and be cognizant of. Um, there's an app that's associated with it and also something called After School which is also an app and we're, we'll explain a little bit about those social media concerns um, in the letter itself but if you do have an interest we would invite you to come in it's going to be the same night as the senior dinner 
but we, we b believe that most senior parents would not be attending this. Um, so uh, I will be early on, I will be with the seniors, and then I'll be coming back here to introduce John Halligan, who will be here for the parent and any community members that have an interest to be part of that. He was here two, several was it years, two ago? years ago. I think you want to say it was three years ago. We had Jeez. I, and I attended high schools, then. Our high school and, students right. will have seen him. And this is going to predominantly, I think we're doing fifth, fifth through eighth grade. Five through eight, and Garrison is also going to join us. How uh, Garrison's five through eight will split the costs with us, and we'll have um, all of Phillips Town students there. Five Dur through eight during the day, and then the parent meeting will, will be. Will there at be night. breakout sessions after that for the parents, like we did? for the CTC? Well, we're going to actually have presenters. We're going to have our support services group that are actually going to be in the, I think it needs to be a community conversation because we'll be talking about some of the social media issues. And so we will have people here. And, and we think it's a kind of conversation everybody should hear. Sure. And so John Halligan will be talking about it from the parent perspective. We'll be talking about it from the school, school perspective and our support services personnel who have been part of the conversations we've been having about all these concerns with social media and are integrally you know, concerned and, and um, part of the process. And so they will be here as well. Out of curiosity, there's been so much um, national pushback about this 13 Reasons Why. Yeah. I mean, it's not just here, it's the whole state, it's the whole nation. Uh, does anyone know if Netflix has made any sort of statement or is it an ongoing series that's been- 13 Reasons too. Uh, they're a continuing it, they're season continuing. Next year there's gonna be a, uh, there's yeah. a new season coming. Yeah. This was a book. Wow. It was a book that, and I read that a couple of years ago and the book has, the end of the book and is the as same as the end of the series, but I guess they're creating a second part of this. Um, so there, there are concerns about what has happened, and unfortunately it seems to be consistent throughout the nation, the reaction to it. And, uh, you know, the, the students. It's very surprising to me that they would continue it. It's one thing to say, well, okay, well, you know, it was what it was. We're you sorry about it. But to continue it is really surprising to me. Very disappointing. How about 13 Reasons to go into therapy, <laughs> 13 <laughs> reasons to go see your school counselor, 13 reasons, you know, I, you know it's just, yeah. it's just so well, much. Well, unfortunately, if you, if you do see the series, and I did watch it, um, they do not depict people um, in schools in a positive light. Um, so it was, and it, it doesn't, the 13 reasons to go see your counselor would not come from that series. And so it's, it's unfortunate because I can tell you that the people here and on our staff that works with our students, they care so much and they would do anything to help a child and to keep them safe. And it's unfortunate that they depicted schools and the principals and the support services personnel in the light that they did because they just dropped the ball all over the place. So it's too bad. Okay, so um, the Haldane Audit Committee will meet on Monday the 22nd at 7.30 in the Maple Merritt Building. If anybody has a real interest in learning about our audit, please join us. Um, the board will meet in special session on Tuesday, May 23rd at 7 o'clock in the Home and Careers classroom where they plan to convene into executive session for the purpose of discussing the employment history of a particular individual, and I'm that individual. So um, no action is planned to be taken at this time. And to be clear, every year the... Yeah, you're going to clarify that. <laughs> Let me just clarify for anybody who's wondering. Okay. Uh, the board is in charge of doing the superintendent's annual evaluation. Yep. That is one of the things, um, that is one of the board's tasks, and um, we meet in executive session to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, so just there's three steps to that, the board, uh, Diana presents her self-evaluation to the board. The board reflects on that. We do our own evaluation. We take a couple sessions to do that. And then we work together to present uh, Dr. Bowers with the evaluation and to give feedback and to, to talk about um, things that have gone well and things that can go better. Um, and uh, things like uh, annual increases are tend to be discussion points around the evaluation but beyond that it's really more about kind of an internal um, progress report we can put the um, 
think we did it last year, the, the template that we use, the rubric, mm -hmm. on the uh, board doc agenda. Sure. Oh, so great. Good idea. Mm -hmm. Can we have Linda do that? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the template. Sure. Okay. All right. Um, Luncheon for the Haldane Academy at St. Basil's is Wednesday, May 24th at 1 o'clock. So we've talked a little bit about what will happen there. And there's a, um, the invitation is um, in the agenda if people have an interest in seeing it. Um, schools are open Friday, May 26th. That is a snow makeup day, um, and, but it will be closed on the 29th for Memorial Day, Monday the 29th. Uh, the June 6th Board of Education business meeting will begin at 6 o'clock rather than 7 o'clock in the music room so that Mr. Salem, Director of Athletics, um, can talk to the community uh, about the proposal for the Hall of Fame. And so the, uh, there will be members of the committee that help to design the Hall of Fame that will be here um, to share their thinking and to answer questions. So if you have an interest, please join us at 6 o'clock that evening before the board meeting that again starts at 7. Uh, the Board of Education workshop on Tuesday, June 20th at 7 o'clock will feature the recognition of this year's retirees and will also celebrate the teachers that received tenure. Um, at the conclusion of the regular session, the board will convene into executive session for the purpose of discussing the employment history of an individual. No action will be, ta will be taken during that time. And the last is the Board of Education has established their annual reorganization meeting for Wednesday, July 5th at 7 o'clock. Um, so if you have an interest in learning about who's going to be doing what for the district um, through the, the following year, please join us there. Um, information reports. I hope there are no students here. Very good. Um, Mr. Harrington. Yeah, Mr. Harrington is at his son's concert tonight. Oh, good. Very good. Good for him. So he's not here. Um, so uh, let's start with Ms. Sniffen. Um, just want to start tonight. I think some of you got a chance to see the middle school concert. Um, I just want to congratulate all the musicians. Uh, and as well as Ms. Fabroda and Ms. Serino on another fabulous spring concert. Uh, along the lines of the arts, I would also like to thank Mr. McGrory um, for all of his hard work with the Lion King. Uh, it was spectacular. As we always say, we want to start small at Haldane, um, nothing over the top, and by the end of the performance and the production, it was over the top and it was spectacular. But just a quick, I, it's so important that I thank these parents for all their hard work because they put countless hours into making this happen. Um, so in addition to Mr. McGrory, uh, Mr. Smith, who brought the Lion King Jr. to us at no cost, uh, Lisa Sabin, Laura Danilov, Beth Shanahan, Kathy Gordnier, Melissa Skanga, uh, Neil Saddleman, uh, Melissa Angier, Sonia Rizriski, Evelyn Carr-White, Candace Cole, Damian McDonald, Theo Bates, and Quinn McDonald. And of course, there's two students from the high school that were named in that who also uh, have been in the booth at all concerts this year and really helping us with lighting and sound. So a big shout out to the theater and music department here at Haldane. Um, I also need to congratulate our Haldane High School students on a spectacular prom. Um, the kids were excellent. They enjoyed themselves. Um, we had close to 100 students at the after prom party over at the bowling alley. We had over $1,000 worth of donations that were donated by community members to encourage our students to be at the bowling alley bowling. Um, it was a nice late night. Um, Dylan Byrne was crowned king and Aaron Ludwith was crowned queen of the prom. Uh, so I just really want to thank the students uh, for making it a spectacular night. Officer Piazza for being there. Uh, Joe Vergidamo. See if I can remember everybody. Uh, Kevin Doherty for organizing it and being the class advisor. Nina Ortiz. Jenna Isabella. And um, I want to say... Eddie Crow. Eddie Crow came to the after prom, but I always forget she gets married, and I want to say her maiden name... Cordero. Cordero. Miss Grasso. That's what I like to say. Sorry, <laughs> Melissa. Uh, Miss Ms. Cord Cordero. Miss Cord Cordero. There you go. So thank you, everybody. Um, I was at that Lion King performance, so is um, Laura and, and uh, Dr. Bowers. I have to tell you, I was really impressed. Yeah. 
It was really good. It was like so age appropriate. And that's what I was impressed by the most, that they took this huge show, it's huge, on many levels, and it all got like condensed down to still tell this perfect story um, in a really sweet way that the kids could like get into. I just thought it was great. And all the actors and actresses were phenomenal. Yeah, it was really it good. Was I'm I'm turning this over to you. I'm gonna go so Julie doesn't get nervous. She'll get nervous. I'm like, <laughs> okay, Doctor Show up. It's not quite my Good evening, everybody. Um, about two weeks ago, actually, it may have been exactly two weeks ago, I had the privilege and honor of presenting to our entire sixth grade class uh, through the Learning Differences Committee. So I want to thank Corey Reister and Maven Wong for uh, setting that up and for inviting me. Um, the presentation that I gave to the sixth grade was on presumed competence, presuming competence, and it was a nice dialogue to have with our youngsters in the sixth grade about uh, social constructivism and inclusion, although we didn't use those terms exactly, about embracing different abilities and um, general differences in others. And so uh, it was a great and profound reminder to me of why I joined the school community. It was a really wonderful moment to have that dialogue with our youngsters. Um, and I think also the prom is a great example of that too, and our prom king and queen um, being crowned Aaron and, and, uh, and Dylan. I think that was a wonderful example of what makes this inclusive school community so great. So that was a, a wonderful moment, uh, I think, for all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Solomon. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, just a quick update on our spring sports season. Uh, today, our varsity baseball and varsity softball teams ended their regular season. Uh, both teams are heading to sectionals. We should know who and when they play in the next day or two. Uh, our lacrosse team has their sectional game tomorrow uh, down at Hastings. If anyone wants to come and support the varsity lacrosse program, it's a 4.30 start. Um, uh, 17th? Yes, tomorrow's 17th. Tomorrow, May 17th, 4.30 at Hastings. Um, the varsity lacrosse team will have their first sectional game. If they win, they play again Friday down in Bronxville. So hopefully we play well, have a good time, and we'll see what happens. Um, just want to mirror what Mrs. Sniffin said. Heard a lot of great things about the prom. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to be there, but I wanted to thank all the chaperones. I know the kids had a great time, and um, I just want to thank Mrs. Sniffin for really taking the lead with prom uh, and really doing a great job of overseeing it. So, um, yeah, uh, not too much else uh, that I need to report on. Um, so, yeah, thank you. The Athletics Booster Club, do you want to mention that is uh, for the spring season will be Monday? Monday, June 5th. Yeah, I think I said that last month, but a reminder, Monday, June 5th, we'll have our spring athletic awards night for the booster from the Booster Club. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Torty. <coughs> Good evening. Uh, usually in the May uh, meetings, I like to talk about my staff and uh, thank them for what they've done with all the setups and the maintenance staff also. Uh, we have a lot coming up in June, so they're going to be busy with all the setups and breakdowns. It's all the behind-the-scenes stuff that nobody sees, like even for all the rehearsals, they have to set up the risers, break them down for gym class, back up at night, and everything else. So thanks to my staff for that. I also want to let you know about uh, three of my maintenance workers, or four of my maintenance workers that all get quite a bit of work done and save the district a lot of money with stuff that a lot of other districts have to go out, out with. Um, we were having some problems with some of our phone lines that went from this building to the Mabel Merritt building, the old Verizon lines when there's bad weather and rain, like all spring. Uh, we were losing fax lines. Sometimes the fire panels were acting funny. So uh, our telephone expert told us that if we got ran cable from the high school to the Mabel Merritt, and obviously that needs to be done underground, that we can get 12 new clean lines. and. Jeff Pallas and Michael Zacatis were able to do that, and that's no easy job running all that cable underground. So uh, now our, our fire panels are fine there, uh, the fax machines, everything else. And um, also we have a groundsman, uh, Tony Strunconi, who's done a tremendous job with the fields uh, during the spring with all the bad weather. You know, 
keeping those fields in shape with all the rain and mud is, is not easy. And he also saves the district a lot of money. He continually does all the mechanical work on the Kubota and our Skag lawnmower, and that's not an easy job. We have a bus mechanic that does the buses, but Tony's all around grounds. He, he can be a mechanic. And uh, Gary helped him with the fields this year, and so did Jeff. So I want to thank my whole entire staff. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Okay, any communication from the public? Then we'll move on to uh, consent agenda. May I have a motion? Motion. Any discussion? These are the minutes from the last board meeting. Oh, I didn't second it. Oh, sorry. Motion. Second. All those Aye. in favor. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just jump the gun. <laughs> Consent agenda financial. Motion. I'll make the motion. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. I don't think we're accepting. Yep, this is what oh, right. we, this this we accept. This right. is, yes, yeah. I'm sorry. This week, yes, this yes, month. Yes, yes. Uh, this yes. These were on last yes. time. Yes. Right. Okay. Consent agenda personnel. May I have a motion? Motion. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, moving into unfinished business. Um, I think we talked about this the last time. Were we just trying to firm it up? Um, I think, Margaret, you were going to check if. And August, Thursday, August 17th works for me. Okay. And Monday, August 28th also works for me. Okay. I think it was me and Peggy that were the ones that were. Uh, yeah. Right. I mean, I don't have a vacation scheduled, but which, I can work around it. Which one for the uh, August meeting? I, right, for the... Um, yeah, we and for the retreat. For the right. retreat. And I think we should probably wait for, for Jen. College. Right. Oh. I don't... Which one? We uh, need to have the business meeting because Ann needs to send out the tax bills. <laughs> so I think we, if we're all good with the 17th, then we should probably keep that one as is. Okay. <laughs> oh, so but, so but if but if we could find somebody else to video the, we could do that. I think that's a relatively quick meeting, anyway. Yeah. Um, so yeah. I think we'll keep that uh, for the seventeenth, mm -hmm. and we, right? Is we read that? Or you wait yeah. Oh, uh, I think she'll be okay. She'll be all right. <laughs> Time. Okay, the recommended action is that the Board of Education designates Thursday, August 17th, 2017 at 7 p.m. as their August business meeting. Motion. 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 Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, thank you. And we said we were going to have the uh, board retreat on uh, the 28th. We'll keep that, and I guess if we have any issues, we can discuss that and then as we get closer. One of the questions that we had um, is, if, would you like us to look at Winter Hill again as a location? Yeah, that's why it's nice. I like it, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sure. And we'll do that. Recommended action is that the Board of Education designates Monday, August 28th, 2017, from 6 to 9 p.m. as their board retreat. Motion. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any additional communication from the public? No? Okay. Moving on to new business. Um, the approval of the Westchester Putnam School Boards Association slate of officers and directors. I believe Julia had sent us this. Yep. Okay. Um, 
Ready? Yes. The recommended action is that the Board of Education casts a yes or no vote for the 2017-18 Westchester Putnam School Boards Association Nominating Committee slate of officers and directors and a yes or no vote to ratify the 2017-2018 Westchester Putnam School Boards Association budget. So the first um, ballot is cast your district's vote on the 2017-18 nominating committee slate of officers and directors do we have to wait for ten or we have a no, four. Have we have four. four I vote yes 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 cast your district's vote to ratify the 2017 18 budget yes 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 Okay, the next item is the, um, we had asked, um, there's been some discussion about inter interscholastic sports and the costs per sport. And we asked uh, Dr. Bowers and, and Mr. Solemn to put together um, some figures for us. And I don't know how, do we wanna present this? Are we just gonna talk it through? or does anybody have any questions? We were presented with two different um, sets of figures initially. Was the second one we got backing out the um, sectional games? Okay. Well, and this request came from the, regarding the hockey, because of the hockey Because of game. hockey. Yeah. Um, so do we have to make a decision on that? Well, I think Chris is looking for um, some guidance because we have to say whether or not we're going to be part of that group. And if, for those of you who may not have been part of the discussion, um, there is a new hockey team that is going to be created that um, could be up to four school districts coming together. And it wouldn't be that we were playing for a different district. It would be a, all districts would be come together to create a new hockey team. And the cost for um, our students, based on the way that the costs will be divided up would be the district paying two thousand uh, dollars per student. Um, go ahead. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Go ahead. And okay. Finish. Two thousand dollars per student, a total of eight thousand dollars for the four students that would be part of it. Um, and we wanted to see how that compared to other sports, and um, the there will be another component that um, the parents who have um, also supported the teams. When it was at Hen Hud, um, there's there may be an additional cost there, so um, we were kind of opening it up for discussion. And in order to kind of compare what the hockey team would cost versus the other sports, we did the analysis, and there is um, a per pupil expenditure for each of the teams. So the conversation. Did you want to add anything, Mr. Salm? So I just wanted to explain uh, kind of what went into this. And, um, you know, I think when you're presented with data, sometimes you just see the final number. But there's a lot of variables that go into this, so I want to make that clear. Um, if you look at your report, um, it has everything from coaches' salaries to the equipment costs to uniforms to chaperone pay to the cost of transportation, the cost of mileage based on the transportation, as well as the BOCES fees and officials. Um, there are different variables. Uh, for example, um, one sport might have a much higher chaperone fee um, amount than others because they've played more games, especially home games. Um, some might have a much higher transportation cost because they're traveling further. So there's just different things that go into it. So I think to just look at it and think that um, you know each sport um, you know could be the same uh, isn't really a reality. I think there's different, like I said before, variables that go into every sport and the decisions that we sometimes have to make. Uh, in terms of hockey, um, Dr. Bowers was just mentioning, the proposal is a four-school merger, I'm, I apologize, a five-school merger with 
Lakeland and Walter Panis being the whole, um, majority of the players, and then Hendrick Hudson, Haldane, and Putnam Valley also contributing. So it would really be the five schools forming one team to get kids in the area onto one local high school team. It's not uncommon in Section 1 for four to five schools to have a merger, especially in hockey. Uh, hockey is such a unique sport because of the hours, the ice time, and the cost. It's the most expensive sport by far. Most school districts cannot afford to fund a hockey team on their own, uh, especially smaller schools. The few schools that have their own team are usually double A schools, which for people that are unfamiliar with that, you're talking 260, 270 kids per class, as opposed to that's pretty much what we have at the high school. So schools that are four to five times bigger than us. So the cost per hockey player, um, like Dr. Bauer said, would be about $2,000 next year uh, per child. And we have four current uh, hockey players that would be interested in returning and playing next year for the merged program. So have you talked to the parents? Like how many, once you combine five schools, how many players are there going to be? Are our kids going to get any playing time at all? And is that a problem for the parents? So the way the merger was uh, – form basically if it goes through all the athletic directors met from those schools and we discussed you know how many kids are you going to have who's going to have the coach we went over all the different um you know things that we needed to go over and we actually of our four kids we would have four of the stronger players um so they would be playing they would be contributing they'd be on the ice um hockey like i said is it's unique in the sense that a lot of these kids on other, um, use the high school hockey team as uh, one form of playing, but they also play outside as well. So if you have 24, 25 kids, let's say, on the total roster, on a game day you might only have 14 or 15 because they're playing travel hockey, they're playing in tournaments all weekend. Hockey is so unique um, that it's really something that is different, and it's hard to compare to you know, just basketball or soccer or baseball just because there's so much that goes into it. It's just such a different – uh, sport overall, but our kids would be playing from what I've been told. But you'll have 24 kids on the roster, but you really wouldn't expect more than 14 there at any game. Yeah, I just there's even this year with the merger with Hendrick Hudson, we had five players on a team. Um, our five were significant contributors to the team. Right. So for me, the idea that one sport is more expensive than another sport is just it makes sense to me that that would be the case i don't have a pro i don't have a problem with it and i, I and if our students are going to play on behalf of the school my initial inclination but i could be talked out of it <laughs> is that it's in the school's resp responsibility i mean that's really the direction that we're really wanting to move in that 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 the activities that students participate in are, are, are the activities that the school is over overseeing and, and that participation and the funds for yeah, and it gives it something to do the only thing that, that Chris just said that then concerned me a little bit was well like what would it mean like I'm probably a little bit different than Margaret I don't that that our students would play because they're they're good matters less to me personally. Well, my, but, my concern is. Well, but, well, let me just finish. Was but that they are so busy with other leagues, and that they might not be available to play. That to me is concerning, right? Because it's one thing to, it's one thing to say, yeah, we we want our kids to this. We're going to invest this money in it. For then our kids to do it, but then if. So our kids weren't going to be around to do it half the time, then I'm a little confused about why we would do it. No, and, and, I, yeah, and I understand that. Our kids, I can only speak about the commitment from level from our kids. They are committed to the school team. They have been in the past. They will continue to be. The kids from other programs, that may not be the priority. So I can contest to that because I've seen Chris at many hockey games. <laughs> uh, our kids do participate, and no, they are great. big contributors. Yeah. Um, you know, to the program. Yes. 
So I have a question. I'm, I'm walking into this conversation without the beginning part of it. But um, so if this question's been asked, I apologize. But so this is a potential five school merger, right? Correct. So I'm assuming the athletic directors from these other schools are talking to their boards right now and saying, hey, are you guys willing to pay X so our kids can all do this? Say one of the schools says, you know what, we got turned down. Pitt Valley says, sorry, our board says no. So it's just going to be four of you. Mm -hmm. Does that mean that the amount that we're being asked to contribute would increase? Uh, right now, we are the only school that hasn't approved the merger. Um, it could technically increase if players drop out. It could also be reduced if players come out of nowhere and want to play. So if we have one or two more kids, the cost may go from 2000 to I'm just throwing out a number, 1800 per kid. Or same thing if Hendrick Hudson has one or two more kids or Puff Valley. So the cost could technically go down if there are more kids that come out for hockey. Okay. Does that answer your question? It does. It and, does. And if the team is big, and this might not be our kids, but if the team is big and the other parents go, my kid's never going to get on the court, I'm not paying the extra $1,000, they could drop out, which could kick our prices up. So how do you think we should go about coming up with a figure that's fair for our kids to play hockey? So what is the proposal now? It's 2,000. Sorry, I missed the numbers in the beginning. Yeah, it was 2,000 per player. 2,000 per player, and the school contributes 1,000. No, it's 2,000 per player that we're contributing, and then the parents pay another 1,000. And the parents pay another 1,000 oh, on that. Pay two and then we the pay 2, and the parents pay That's not what this says. This says it includes ice time. The, in, in the note, it's, it's, it, it includes some of it, yeah, not all of it. So the parents are still paying $1,000. And, and have we talked to these parents and the parents are on board with this? The parents have paid 1000 in the past, yes. This isn't an additional increase. No, but are or they on increase. board with the, the five school merger? And um, I haven't talked to all of them, to be honest with you. I could reach out to them immediately um, and see where they're coming from. This was the only possibility right now based on location and who needs another team to come on board. Um, that's the other issue we have is because hockey, there are only so many rinks in the area. We don't want to have a merger where our kids are driving, you know, an hour, 20 minutes to a hockey practice. And that's another thing. It doesn't include transportation. No, there's no transportation from the district's end. It just seems to me like this sounds like a travel team. Once you hit more than three schools, it sounds like a travel team. Hockey is a very interesting I mean, sport in Section 1. I mean, we're not the only school who's faced with this dilemma because then we wouldn't be. But, so who are they going to play? If the five local schools are going to be the team, who are they playing against? No, so hockey, uh, the best way White I Plains has a huge program. So the best way I can explain it is in – all our other sports, there are multiple. There are four or five classifications: double A, A, B, C, and sometimes D. In hockey, there's just Division One and Division Two. With the merger, we would be bumped up to a Division One school, which would be your Mayapax, your Carmels, your Brewsters. Because of the total enrollment of the five schools, we would be placed in the upper bracket, where we would still be able to be competitive. But that's just the way the rules are. Based on the total enrollment, we would be bumped up from a Division Two to div Division One. And we've played those schools. Though. Yeah, we still play them. Now. I mean, with our current merger, we played those schools. Yes. What was our cost prior to this per? What was the per pupil <laughs> breakdown? For roughly, like la we like for. This, this year? This year. It was similar. I believe it was around 2000 as well. We had five this year play. Wait a second, wait a second. We were already paying 2000 So are, we just, are you just asking us to approve the merger then? Well, yes and no, because at one point we weren't paying anything. And then um, Hen Hud. This was the first us, year we contributed. Yeah, and asked us to pay the equitable amount which we did for the first time. But now we have to decide if we're going to continue to do this going forward. And now it's no longer with Hen Hud. Now Hen Hud is now going into this merger. So it's changing. Wait, we didn't pay anything last year? No, we did. Last year, this the year, season, in yes. the years before. Two years ago. Right now, this team for this year we paid for. But it hadn't been. We had just merged with them. And there had been an agreement um, with most districts we just merge. But because hockey is so expensive, Hen Hud said we have to charge you at this point. And now it's moving into. And this we new had team. the money this year. Right. 
It was, and was it um, part of, I know you get sort of like an athletic discretionary yeah. $10, budget. Mm -hmm. Was this pulled from that or was it pulled from something else? Um, and do you remember what we pulled it from? I don't remember in yeah, particular, think. but it did um, put the athletic budget in where I needed to pull some available funds that were available in other parts of the budget because it did put the entire athletic budget over. So wait, there was eight kids last year? Five. There were five kids last year, and we're only losing one senior, one senior. Michael? Correct, Michael. So it was $10,000 last year? This Which year. is the amount that we have in the discretionary funds for additional coaches, so that's, that's what it We didn't went use, to. and I kept asking, the question about coaches because we didn't use the majority of the coaches that are on that list that I, we were given. I mean, to put in perspective, because we, we have the numbers and, and the uh, people out there, do, they don't. So put this in perspective, I mean, this is twice as much as our most expensive sport and three or four times as much as pretty much all the every other sport. So this is way beyond the, 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 you know, what we currently pay. So um, just to put that in perspective, like, this is not. I would go back to those parents and ask if they're on board with that big of our journey. I think if, if I was a hockey parent, that would change my perspective. Why? They're still playing for their school. We don't have, yeah. that, we don't have that many more kids on the merge than last year's. Yeah. With Hendrick Hudson, we were still in the low 20s. Now I think we're up to 23 or 24. I, I think the flavor changes completely. I think it, it's a travel team. It becomes a travel team. But I think they would be okay with that. Because the, the district would be paying I for them to be on a travel team. I think travel teams are going to Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Long Island. They're not going to ice time in Newburgh um, to play on a Friday or Saturday night. Um, from what I've witnessed this past season, there's really a great um, relationship. I know it was just Hen Hud and us, um, and Hen Hud really treated our students just like one of theirs. And honestly, our kids got more playing time than theirs. theirs. Um, and it's still the same four kids. Except for one that gradu is graduating. You know, when we were initially got this information, like my first thought was, um, you know, Haldane doesn't have a hockey team. It just doesn't, and people need to be okay with that. We don't have a hockey team, we don't provide for a hockey team, we can't afford to provide for a hockey team, so we don't. Um, but I don't know, I'm kind of changing my opinion on that a little bit right now, thinking if we can afford it, why not, why not let them do it? Yeah, I, I mean, this is something that obviously they're passionate about. Right? I mean, kids who play hockey, I mean, they're passionate about it. It's important to them. Their family is committed to it. Their family is paying a lot of money for them to be able to do this. Plus, they're transporting them. So their family is committed to it. The kids are committed to it. We have the money to pay for it. So even though it seems like it's a lot of money, uh, relatively speaking, and it is, um, I don't know, I'm kind of feeling like, we should make it happen for them. I mean, it's one of the things that I feel like Haldane has, has done, and maybe the things don't always, you can't always put an exact price tag on it, but I do feel like Haldane has really, it's one of the, it's one of the lovely things about the districts. It's one of the things that, that's afforded to us because we're relatively small is that I think that the administrators historically really go I don't want to say go out of their way, but make a real attempt to make sure that kids have the kinds of educational and extracurricular activities that are going to be most beneficial to them. And and so I'm I'm like Jen. I'm actually less concerned. Like, are they going to play? Or are they not going to play? My bigger concern, fr quite frankly, is that are we starting a sport that's going to require such a large a, a, a sport that's a school sport that requires a family financial contribution that's actually my biggest concern right i mean because i only sport though i honestly i didn't um, know that cuz i just golf, feel, cuz i feel I like that's just such my, a huge 
kids own, right. you know, golf equipment. Right. Yeah. And that's a Cause, pretty penny. Because to me, to. these really become <laughs> equity issues, right? I mean, if it's a school activity, I feel like it needs to be available to every single student. And I think right. that fa fi families' financial ability shouldn't have to factor into it. And even though right now it's these four kids and it's, well, you know, it, to make a decision like this, we're making a commitment to join a team, correct me if I'm wrong, we're making a commitment to be part of this team going forward, right? And if we're part of this team going forward, I would just want to make sure that family financial circumstances didn't limit kids access to what is a district But that sport. already unfortunately happens. I guess. I don't guess I realize that. You know, whether it's, I, I mean, and I don't know what the answer is. Like, if somebody wanted to be on the golf team, and even though the parents currently are asked to pay for their own golf clubs, if somebody said, hey, I really want to be on the golf team, but I can't afford my own golf clubs, we does the school of team figure, clubs. figure something out? It's the same out? with, you know, softball or baseball. There's team bats. You don't need your own. Obviously, most kids want their own, um, but we do have team clubs that they could use. Um, is it ideal? Probably not. But at the end of the day, there is that opportunity to still play with what the school is providing. So it hockey isn't is actually... So hockey... Yeah. Ho Hutt probably has their equipment. Well, right. Hutt's paying pay for, their, for their, yeah. the equipment. We don't have it. But the, the parents are still contributing $1,000, and they're saying it's for ice time. So And transportation. Yes. So, yes. So what's the two thousand dollars? What is the what is the coaches other expense? Coaches, other equipment, referees, chaperones, all the things that obviously I included in our report for what we spend. Right. It's the same thing. A hockey but team. Why is it? Why is it so much higher? I mean, I understand that there's different. I, ice time. A hockey. A hockey. Uh, to rent ice time for an hour is between three and five hundred dollars, depending on day of the week, right. uh, where you're going. A hockey high school program costs between sixty-five and seventy-five thousand dollars just to run that team. So even if you look at our most expensive team, it's half of that, you know, or sixty percent of that. Hockey is just a sport that is, it's very expensive just because of the ice time. So that's a good point. I mean, would we say so if we're gonna if we can honestly say in every other sport that we have. Even if the parents are s contributing sometimes, if they're not able to, the school picks up the tab or finds the equipment for them or finds the transportation for them. Right. So would we say, can we say the same thing about hockey? That if for some reason we've got this great kid who wants to play hockey and his parents can't come up with $1,000, are we going to come up with it for him? So that's a complicated question. Um, I'll give you an example from last year and I won't mention names. Out of five players, four paid the thousand that was asked. One did not. Um, it's something where you cannot force the families to pay. It is asked as like a donation for their hockey club or hockey association. Okay, so that to me sounds like it's the same situation. I mean, I don't. Want, I'm not saying. Ahead, I, I'm I don't not. know how I. I mean, I'm not saying I'm against it, but I'm just like we originally got into the hockey team because it was like. We weren't paying for it. it was, they were going to Hen Hut, and, and, and there was really no cost to the district. So just like we used to have the, the team of one, the, the swimmer, Beacon, right. at Beacon. So if all of a sudden, like the next year, they came back and said, oh, Beacon said we have to pay $10,000 for, for, for the swimmer, we'd be like, well, we don't have a swim team. It'd be nice if we had a swim team. Like, we, like if, if, if when we first did the Hen Hud, if they said, oh, Hen Hud wants us to join their, their team, it's $2,000 a player, we would have probably never of, of entertained that. Um, so it's kind of like, uh, a, I don't want to say bait and switch because that's not what happened, but that is kind of what happened where, you know, we said, oh, come on in, it's free. Oh, nope, now it's not, you know. And, well, and I'm not saying that was a plan. I'm not, I'm not going there at all. But I'm just saying, so we never would have entertained it if we had, if, 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 um, if, if, if it was, a, if it was always an initial cost. And that's a good point that you bring. That is right. What if, what if the students that are on it have it? You're right. We probably would. So it could be minimum $8,000 a team with a possibility of up to 10. So, you know, but I'm we just, just have to be careful because and I'm not, then there are other sports that we share with other districts that you're going to be may, we may potentially be punishing a whole bunch of other different 
sports it, and groups, and it, it, I'm not sure we want to go there. It's not a matter of punishing. It's just a matter of any wait, any wait, wait, what any. Do you mean? We share sports with Garrison. We right, share right, sports right. with Putnam Valley. But what do you mean punish? If, if these set of hockey parents come in and say, hey, how come so-and-so is playing whatever, uh, wrestling at Putnam Valley? Well, because I mean, my point is that... that you mean if the, we say no? The district oh, is if we say the, no. But the district... Then it's going to have to be no across the board is be, what I'm saying. No, but that's uh, not... I, 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 the district established whatever point they, they created the teams that, okay, we're going to create a team and we're going to commit financially to a team and team up with the school district. We never committed financially to a hockey team. We just said, oh, yeah, sure, we'll, we'll approve it, but, you know, because there's no cost to the district, okay? Now, and it's not even like, okay, now there is a little cost. It's like, okay, now not only is there a cost, but the cost is – twice as much as any other sport that we currently pay for. So it's not even like, oh, could we get a little bit of, of it? So Do we it, talk to the parents and ask them, hey, what are you willing? Uh, we're willing to come I, I, up with a figure. And I mean, I hate to, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't know. They already are know. paying it's, so it's, much. No, yeah, that's what I'm saying. I, I don't want to sit there and negotiate with parents for a school thing. I mean. Do our numbers go up and down if – you go back and talk to those parents, and the parents say, "You know what? We're not playing this year." I mean, that happens. If, if our if our kids aren't playing, what yeah. do you mean? So, say it's not four kids this year. Say it's six kids this year, or say it's three kids this year. Do our does that two thousand dollars go up or down? Yeah, I, basically, what what I said before was, if we have more kids come out, the cost should go down. If we have less kids come out, the cost could go up. And you're talking about total kids. Yes, total kids not from all the kids. schools, not just Haldane. So it's an estimate, this 2000 per kid. It's, it's an estimate. It could be more, could be less. And are we also, I mean, these kids are kids that have been playing it for a long time, right? At least a few years. Um, and it, does it seem to be the same core of kids, or do you feel like there's new kids coming up? I believe there's one current seventh grader that will be in eighth next year that will probably play in two years. But I'm, that's the only kid in middle school that I'm aware of. There's no one else has reached out. That currently play, but okay. So we don't really expect it. You wouldn't expect this to like blow up, no. you know, into massive amounts. Uh, we of, don't have twenty-five of, hockey players in the district. No. <laughs> I don't think no, I'm, that's knows, what we need. We yeah. This I mean, this isn't uh, just the Haldane issue. This is almost every school that's below an A. Uh, two to three to four to five schools are merging to give kids opportunities to do something that they may not be able to do because they can't afford travel, which is even more expensive. Or they can't go to Pennsylvania or Boston or Rhode Island on a weekend to play tournaments. And the merger agreement's for one year. One year, correct. And, and next year we might be in a whole different situation. Hen Hut might have more kids. We might be able to go back to just a two-school merger. It all Their numbers went down tremendously this year, so both of us couldn't field the program. So we had to reach out to someone else who needed both of us. Okay, so okay, this is something that we reevaluate, which we do with all year. sports mergers. We reevaluate them every year. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not like this is a sentence, so a commitment forever. So would this cost come out of the sports budget, or would the sports budget be increased to offset the cost? We did put uh, additional funds in the sports budget for 17-18 for hockey, but not... Um, to the level that we're talking about. But we also have still have the $10,000. We have the contingency. That's right. We could pull from. Um, the, the additional, the $10,000 that we put in for discretionary oh, right. costs that, um, if, especially if we have large numbers and we need an assistant coach. Okay. So that's still there. So the money is, is there. We're not pulling from anything else to make it happen. Did the district have a recommendation? <laughs> I think we should support our kids. Yeah, I kind of do too. Uh, I mean, so what's the worst case scenario, right? The worst case scenario is that like more and more kids get really, really interested <laughs> in a sport or an activity and, and it becomes unsustainable. To me, like that's the worst case scenario. We have all these kids that want to do all these new and different and exciting things. And yeah, I mean, the time could really come when we would have to say no. 
But I was thinking about this today when I got the the report, and I was like, yeah, the, the different sports cost different amounts of money, and I bet if you stopped to think about it, you could actually estimate each individual child's, the cost to educate each individual child, right? I mean, you could do it. Right? You could go and you'd say, well, how much does this teacher cost? And it costs more to educate high school kids. And maybe it costs more to educate kids who take AP courses. And maybe it takes more. We know it costs more to educate kids who have special needs. And so the idea, well, I totally get Evan's point. And I know that of all the people on the board, I'm the one that tends to be least worried about money. And it's not because I don't care, but it's because I want things to happen. I mean, and not, not that other people don't, but I, I recognize that I'm not the most penny-pinching of the five of us. But there's a part of me that, I don't know, there's a part of me that feels like if kids really want to do something and it's within our ability to do it, let's let's do it. And again, I think the worst case scenario is we have to start we have to start saying no i mean which we say no to lots of things but i don't i don't know but the other thing too and and this may never happen but it's also possible that in the future as it, with little districts little districts tend to have to they have to to join together right. oh, and if actually. there's if there's just not enough students to run a team then you may combine with something so with a little district like Haldane this may be something we do more than once and it may be something that we do in something other than hockey right. And so we're, we're trying it. I also think it would be very important, though, Chris, for us to let the parents know that, you know, it's going to be an annual kind of decision while it's sustainable. And so it's, it's not a guarantee that it's going to happen forever. But I, I, I would go even further. I mean, what would make me feel a little better mm -hmm. is if we establish a cap for the team. Oh. Meaning, like, what if next year two other kids want to join? Now it's a $12,000 commitment. To the district, you but know. What about other sports? So, do you think we should establish caps for but other sports? This is, as I said, this is twice as much as the most expensive sport. But so I this can is not say even that about sports here, right? There's inequity amongst the sports here, right? We no. could have this argument. I don't think so. I don't think there is. And and if you look at if you look at the sports analysis, we've never done this before. So I think this was a really good. This this brought up a great conversation. Oh, it was a lot of okay. fun. I mean, so <laughs> thank you so much. I mean, obviously, it was, it was a you know, really helpful to take the guess. Do it again. Not, in Ten years. You mean, you mean obviously football is the most expensive, but football is the most expensive because of the the equipment and and the conditioning of the equipment and, and so forth. So everybody knows that. So so you take football out of the mix and. All the other teams are pretty much within a couple hundred dollars of each other, you know, give or take. And um, but it also depends on the number of students. There's a lot of but, uh, info but this in that is, data that this you have is, to. I mean, the the argument that we can afford it. I mean, I think I don't know. I think that's a weird argument because of course we can afford it. We can afford to to buy the furniture that we said we weren't going to buy. You know, no, I mean, we uh, well, well, yes, we can. We we we, we budget. We can prioritize. Okay, I mean, however you know, we want to prioritize. We can afford it. So like, if we didn't, it's not like oh, we if we if we don't do this, we're gonna we don't. What are we gonna do with our ten thousand dollars? So again, I'm not saying I'm not gonna, I'm not for it. I'm just saying I, I think it's. I, I just feel as though I mean, because I've been on this I've been on this board before when when parents have come and asked for teams and they've been denied. And this kind of seems like it got snuck in the back door. There's nothing team. being snuck in. I well, it's like it's oh, it's prior <laughs> to this, but I'm pretty sure these discussions were the, pretty the, loud and clear. The cause, about no, people hockey. have come. People have come to the board asking for coaches. People have come to the board asking for teams, and they were told that, that we can't afford it at this point. Okay, so this kind of came in the back door. Meaning, and again, I don't, I'm not saying this was part of a scheme. Okay, but I'm just saying it just happened naturally. Where oh, okay, it's a it's a team. There's no cost to the district. Boom. Now there's a big cost to the district. So as I said, if they if they would have walked in here two years ago and said we would like to set up a hockey team for you know almost ten thousand dollars, it never even would have been considered. Okay. But the difference, Evan, is that that's not what happened, and it's not because of any reason beyond the fact that they have a low turnout at Hen Hud this year, or incoming year, right. upcoming year. But that was never. It was never even on the like. I'm, 
Whatever the reason is, I, I don't think it was. It, I guess we didn't look at it close enough to say, well, what happens? Is it? We never. I don't think anyone even asked. Well, is there a chance the, that we it's are? One of the many be reasons with the bill? that we relook at mergers every year. You know, there is this built-in checks with these things. Right. They're not just ongoing where all of a sudden there's a cost incurred that we don't know about. This is an annual thing that we look at, and so now we're looking at it. And okay. there's and the the merger's changing. Uh, the okay. needs are changing, and so we get to say, do we want to change with it or not? It's okay. Listen, all I'm saying is this is going a little against. I, I, I've seen you're gonna. I, I've seen a lot of things come by. I've seen people. What was the team that was looking for the assistant coach? What and what was the the um, they wanted the extra coach that that we couldn't give them. Um, lacrosse. Was it lacrosse? Yeah. I think it was lacrosse. Yeah, they wanted the extra coach, and we and we told they could we couldn't give it to them because we didn't have the money. Okay, so um, yeah, if we if we but said no to exactly it, if we if, if, if we said if we said no to it, listen, there's five board members, so we don't need one person can't stop anything. But if we said no to it, we'd have the four parents in here saying, "Why'd you kill our team?" But be prepared for other parents to come in and say, remember two years ago when we asked for this and we were told that? Okay, so I'm just saying, you know, be but prepared that for that conversation. That is why we created yeah. the discretionary fund for Chris so that he could handle those needs as they come up. The oh, we need it. We have extra okay. kids signing up for a certain sport. We need another coach. That's why that ten thousand dollar discretionary fund was created, not for Chris, for the athletic department. So that those issues could be but addressed. Again, we have to be careful because we merge with a lot of different programs to provide our students, whether we realize it or not, with opportunities outside of Haldane. The merge, so it's is, not the just merge, the merge is hockey. not the point. It's the cost is the point. All I'm saying is this is a giant leap from 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 conversations we've had on athletics over over the years. Okay, so we we as I said we we've, we've turned down assistant coaches. We've turned down um, teams that wanted to start. Okay, because of, of the cost and the cost was was minimal. Okay, two three thousand dollars. So that's all I'm saying. That this is a giant leap from from positions that the board has taken in the past on athletics. So I said just be prepared for this to open up the door for. Well, wait a minute. I thought we couldn't do this. I thought we couldn't have this. Why can't we have this if we can do that? So I'm just saying this is this is a big leap and, and just to prepare for that. I mean, it's good to have that kind of historical perspective, right, which none of us have, that Evan has. Um, Yeah, yeah, and I mean, I guess I continue I've been to say. Here 27 yeah, yeah. years. Yeah, <laughs> you are. I've been on the board. No, <laughs> but I'm just saying. Yeah. I've been here in this community for 27 years, and I hardly can remember an issue. We we well, I'm saying, a couple we years ago, a that team came in, asked for an assistant coach, and they were told no, it was, it, we couldn't afford it. That was a, that was a couple of years ago. But that was okay. also was that, that was also the budget year when we were talking about maybe cutting a uh, music yeah. teacher? I mean, yeah, probably. That yeah, was. I'm, I'm just saying. No, I, listen. I'm not. Things change, and 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 boards change, and can, situations change. So I'm not saying that we shouldn't do it because of that. But I'm just I'm just trying to give a perspective of that. This is a big leap of of, of the way we've dealt with athletics, um, you know, in in the district before. So. Um, you know, that's all. That's yeah, all I'm that's, saying. It's valuable to hear. Do we have to make a decision tonight? By the end of the school year <laughs> would be ideal. <laughs> so. Poor Chris. No, I'm good. I'm used to it. <laughs> no, we just always are pushing off. He always brings these tough issues to us, and we push yeah. them off. I, I mean, I don't know. I mean, do you? So we need to make a decision about because we signed the merger or not. So we need to make that decision. How uh, the. I don't know. I I'm, I, I'm I mean, honestly, my decision is to, to let the athletic director and the superintendent make the decision. That's my decision. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm you serious. Can't they have a budget. I'm the one signing that merger. They have a budget, they have a budget and, you know, but. But they need us to I think, agree I to think it. That's, that's, I have no problem being, taking that. Right? You don't need our specific. I, uh, I, I have to sign those mergers. Merger, we need right? the board's oh, approval for all mergers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They need the board approval for the merger. You need the board approval for the merger. For all mergers, yes. Yeah. 
Do we, since it's the first time we've talked about it in public, do we wait one meeting to see if we hear from the community? I mean, it seems. I think that's fair. Yeah, I yeah. think that's fair. I can you wait to do that? Have a discussion at least yeah. with the parents involved. Yeah. And we are, if you need, I mean, June we 6th. are, is June 6th okay? Because oh, we, we are meet. having an exec session yeah. on the 23rd. But we can't make any decisions on the 23rd, and we can't talk about it except what we're supposed to talk about. Right, but we could pull out for a public meeting. <coughs> if June 6th should a, be okay. If he needed a... Uh, it should be fine, June 6th. Yeah. Oh, okay. So... But you have, the other ones have committed to, they've signed the merger. Yes, they're okay. waiting on us. Okay. 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 And their districts are paying the exact same amount that we would be paying. Per kid, yes. Okay, so I think that's fair. I mean, I think you have a sense of our opinions. Um, leaning toward. I, I would say the board is leaning towards approval. That's my estimate. Maybe I'm wrong. Um, but the... Um, the public can weigh in and we'll see what they have to say and if anybody has any interesting feedback to, to change our, our thoughts. Um, okay. I still have a lot of stuff to cover. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Chris. Thanks, Chris. Well, Julia did tell me it might be a while, so Good we have plenty of time. Wow. <laughs> Well, our, oh, did they do their? Are they're, they're waiting? They're, wait for the budget. they're on the edge of their seats. They're waiting for the budget <laughs> approval. To go home if you don't want to wait for the budget results. They had some machine issues. Oh. Some machines weren't. Yeah, there was like lots of jamming and then having yeah. to use the other machine and. So. Uh, Okay, so we keep moving on down here. Student representative, is no, that we what we are? Volunteer. volunteer. <laughs> you forgot a long time. That's not here. <laughs> it's not a, oh yes it is, it's number three. three. Oh, yeah. there we go. Board approval process for use of school volunteers. So it hasn't been our practice that we approve volunteers, but I am recommending that we change that practice and we start approving volunteers. And we, we do have an application for volunteers, and we were able to put some other information in there. We revised the application process, and you have a copy of that. And I would just like to recommend as of um, September. I don't have a copy of that. Copy of oh, you don't? Oh, I'm sorry. Well, I will pass it around. Is there a policy currently on volunteers? Yes. Okay. Because... Can we see um, where is that policy? We could not. Can we see that? I couldn't find it. But. All right. I will. I'll, I'll ask Linda to send you both the, the information that we have and and the updated um, application. And so when you're saying volunteers, you mean um, anybody like from a class, a parent? They're having a class party, and the parents coming in to help with the refreshments, well, like this that, be, to or and what? I guess it, Julie, you were saying that in the past, what there was a differentiation between people that could potentially be. My recollection yep. was that if it was people who were left like alone, like if you were an assistant coach and the coach was running back to the building and you were volunteering, you would need to go through this process. But if you were a class parent and the teacher was in the classroom, you were in there with the teacher, it wasn't, that's what it was in the past. Doesn't mean that that's what it needs to yep. be now, but that was the practice. That's why I'd I like to see the too. policy yep. so we can really delve into. Okay. So I will have uh, both of those come to you. We'll put it on the next agenda and we'll continue the discussion. We, sh we also have to talk about fingerprinting because one of the things that we should be doing is also fingerprinting and if it's, um, you know, w w there may be a cost to the district if it's a volunteer that's coming in. So I think we have a number of things to talk about. But um, I, we did modify the application. Um, we will have some information that will come to you. Volunteers probably have to have different criteria than, you know, yes, other volunteers. They have to actually take, they have to be trained, the, the volunteers who, who are sports volunteers. And so there's some training that they have as coaches. And is it also like AED and first aid? First aid, yep. So yes, there are different there are different requirements. So we're really talking about people who are alone with kids. 
or potentially potentially alone, alone. even just for a minute that kind yes. of handoff thing right we just want to make sure that we know exactly who's working with our students Mm -hmm. No, that makes, I mean, that Sounds makes good. a lot of sense. The only thing I know is whenever Chris has had to get fingerprinted to do PTA enrichment, like you have to drive like, to another town. Carmel, maybe? Or yeah, something. he's had to drive to Carmel. He's, yeah. Mayopac? It's a kind of, I mean, we definitely want, like, absolutely. Like, this makes sense, whatever for safety and security makes sense. But if we were going to do it, I would, um, Maybe well, we can bring somebody here. Do no, and actually to go, I had to be fingerprinted at the police department recently. It took a long time because because they don't have do the it. they don't have the, the 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 local police department doesn't have the ability to do the digital fingerprints. They only do the ink fingerprint right. fingerprints, and just take my word for it. <laughs> it takes a really long time. If a volunteer. <laughs> works in a job that's like let's say he's a teacher in another school district so it's, and he's already in the system yeah do they have to get fingerprinted no or as can long as he's in teach mm -hmm. i mean as long as they're in right some type of fingerprinting system right. that we can access mm -hmm. they don't have to go yeah and so i think if and we do have the the record within teach and we can go into there or there anything like if someone's like a fireman in the mm -hmm. or, or a job that would require them to be fingerprinted right. so what do we do retroactive for volunteers that we may have that haven't gone through this process? Well, anybody that will be volunteering next year, we're going to ask them to fill out the application, and if they haven't been fingerprinted, we'll, take, we'll go through that process. It might be interesting to talk with the, because the PTA, I'm sure, does a process for their enrichment. Yes, they do. You know, I mean, to see what their process is, maybe it could get aligned, same process. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what they do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but no, and I think it's probably because that's exactly the enrichment classes, the teachers with kids for an hour or however. Okay, great. Uh, stupid, st stupid. <laughs> <laughs> what time is it? Oh my gosh. Okay, uh, student representatives of the Board of Education. So um, this is something we've talked about before, um, and, the, and it didn't really come exactly to fruition, but we, we have talked about it in the past. Um, I saw an article about um, Bedford doing this, and it kind of reminded me of it, and so I brought it up to Diana, and we are bringing it to the board. Um, but, and I don't know all the details, but the idea would be that one of our high school students, uh, I'm assuming there'd be some sort of like application process, interview process. Um, would become a, kind of a member of the board, a non-voting member of the board. Mm -hmm. um, they would not be allowed to go in executive session with us. They would not be privy to anything that is not public. Um, their vote wouldn't count. But what they would do is have to come to all of our meetings. So it's not like it's a once in a while commitment. It would be a big commitment. And they would be able to be a voice. They'd be a part of our conversations. Um, about all the things we talk about, and they would be a voice um, for those conversations. And so, I think we do this mm -hmm. informally already. We have conversations, right? We sit up um, with the high school students. We invite student representatives here to speak. I think it's a great idea. I think this process would formalize what we're already doing. Yeah, and I think that, we, you know, something we talked about sort of recently in the past, you know, maybe it was two years, a year, um, was trying to make those student representative uh, reports more meaningful. Um, that, like, we really loved hearing from the students, but, you know, could they report on something that we were about to talk about? You know, just trying to connect it a little bit more, and that's not something that's ever really happened. It's like there's work with that, there's legwork with it, there's coordinating with the kids, there's coordinating with the principal who then coordinates with the kid. You know, there's this stuff that happens. But I feel like it's been our intention mm -hmm. to try to get that voice um, a little bit more rhythmic with us, a little bit more ongoing, because we do have these great conversations with the students, but then it's so hard to follow up. It's so hard to, to talk to them again about anything. It's so, you know, and so would a student representative create more of like a formal 
relationship conduit to the student body. Yes, and I think the kids would go back to a student representative who could bring it back to us. I think there's a whole connection there. That, that right, just that like we have. do, right? Like we go to our own constituents or colleagues or whomever with different information or ideas and then bring it back to the board yes. and the students would do the same. And a kid will say something different to a kid than right. a to one of us. Well, I think like it's a great idea too. Okay, we're interrupting this positive idea for Ms. Meyer. Please go to the microphone, introduce yourself. <laughs> Everybody's got their digits okay. ready. Okay. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, the following are the tentative results of the annual district meeting uh, held today, uh, May 16th. Uh, Proposition 1, school budget, passed 218, 5,000, 5, I'm sorry, 518 yes votes, 180 no votes. Nice. Proposition 2, the transportation of vehicles, passed 491 vote, yes votes, 202 no votes. Proposition 3, library gymnasium proposition, passed 532 yes votes, 165 no votes. The trustee election, Margaret Clements received 418 votes. Uh, Write-ins, Sandy McKelvey, 147 votes. Uh, those are the results. If I, I'll answer any questions. Do you have any? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for your much. great work. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. Workers, for your great work. Thank you, Julia. No, go. <laughs> Thank you so much. Very exciting. Yes, we should probably have those. I have the. Do you have the numbers? Yeah, I have the numbers. Okay, we're good. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much you. for all your help. Gone, Woo! Are, gone are the days of the close budget votes. That's very <laughs> right. Nice. Congratulations, yes. budget ladies. Good work. Thank you. Congratulations <laughs> to Miss Clement. Much. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Congratulations to us that we get to serve um, with Ms. Clements for another, yes. uh, okay. however many years Three we get years. to serve with her, yeah. depending on where we're at yeah. in our turn. Yeah. Thank you. I look forward to it. This is good work, guys. I'm excited. Okay. Does anyone want to leave now? You can totally leave. <laughs> <laughs> Tonight, everyone. Good Congratulations, everyone. Thank, good you. Thank you. Thank you. No. Why? Oh, I think. Yeah, yeah you have to. Think, really? Yeah. Do you have to put the write-in name? No. Just the write-in right. candidate. Um, so that's where we are with our student representatives. So um, if you guys are kind of interested in it, think it's a good idea. So I actually have some concerns. Go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. You Do know it. I am all for young people's enfranchisement. Like, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, I guess we would just, uh, <laughs> what, I'm sorry. What? No. I don't know. That's amazing. I, I think we just want to, my concern always with anything in, with, with talking about students is making sure that we hear the diversity of student voices. And so that would be, so I would want us to think really carefully about what, I mean, it's not really a job statement, but what's, what the role statement is, what our expectations are. I'd want us to think about like who identifies this person. I, mean, I guess, and maybe, and I guess you said it would be an applic, they would apply to us. We would decide. Or it could be an election. No, it could it's be a student a, council election. The kids could decide yeah. who they, I don't know. There could be different ways to do it. Right. But you're right. I mean, picking the right student it is important. It is. Um, we need somebody who, one, can make the commitment, right? Like, that's a, it's a big commitment. Right. And we're asking for a year-long commitment. Um, and we're asking, we would want somebody who is interested in board topics, which is not every student. And we'd want somebody who can, you know, talk, um, you know, maturely and effectively and 
I, th I think it's also, I mean, it's, this is a person that would, wouldn't be able to be, they'd miss play. I mean, I think it's fine, but I think it's also just be really cl clear. Like, it, they, the, a student would actually have to plan to give up something, or they'd never be able to make a or meeting. Or maybe they're not that student that this does everything. 10 things. Yeah. All right. Okay. I'm not against it. I just have some concerns about it. Yeah, and I think that it would be, you know, that I think picking the right student is important. Um, and I think that we would have to figure out a way to do that best. And I'm sure, you know, the high school principal would help with that and have some suggestions. What made you put this on the agenda? Like, did, was this just something like, oh, we haven't discussed this, or did something come up? We have well, I saw it in the, um, we have talked about it before. Yeah. Yeah. No, but, um, it so it's been in the back of my head, but it was in an article about Bedford doing okay. it. And that's really what reminded me about okay. it. And then, you know, we were doing, we always have such great conversations at the forums, and I always feel a little bit like we don't quite follow up with it. Like, I'm, you know, I'm there, I'm taking notes, I'm in it, and, you know, and then it's kind of like we leave it. We let the yeah. principal and, and Dr. Bowers follow up with it, which is fine. It's their job, too, not ours. But I do feel like it's a little bit like we're open to them, but then we're not available. And I do feel like the student representative piece is lacking. Like, it's, it just it kind of lacks uh, their roles here. Um, plus, well, I no feel like we're, yeah. we're, we're, really, um, we're really interested in communication, right? That's one of our goals. It's been our goal. It continues to be our goal. Mm -hmm. um, and I think this is another way to create communication with the community. So nothing happened. Yeah, it was I just kind of like... What made, what, what so, you know, it might be something that if we're open to, Diana could speak with the Bedford superintendent and see how they're making it work. If they're making it work, we could talk to Julie, see if she's into, she thinks it's a good idea. You know, we could put it on our retreat mm -hmm. agenda. I think it's a good idea. You know, we could put it on our retreat agenda to try to formalize. Um, um, you know. I'm hearing it may have existed years ago. I don't recall the way it yeah. worked. I'm pretty sure John Z. Natale. Mm -hmm. I think there was a student representative. And it was exactly what you said, not executive session, not anything like that. But. Right. And Beacon, I noticed, um, on their uh, budget vote, had a proposition to add a student representative this year, this season. Oh. And I don't know if we would have to do that. That kind of surprised me that they put it on as a proposition. To, if, only if it's a voting member. Maybe they're going to have a voting member mm -hmm. as a student. That's yeah. interesting. But they put that on. That was one of their propositions on their budget. And I can tell you that when I was a high school principal in Carmel, we did have a, represent, a student representative on the board. And it was just, it, it just it was a different perspective that everybody could hear yeah. and I'm always amazed at some of the thoughts and concepts yeah, that come yeah. up in those meetings. Yeah, and very intelligent. You know, they and they get it. So, um, if you guys are kind of I, cool I with the concept, we we'll put on our retreat. Maybe, maybe, maybe? On the, well, or, no, I would even say the August meeting. The August meeting. Just to, it's not like a retreat. Mm -hmm. Just mm -hmm. only because to like to take up time from the retreat. Like, uh -huh, yeah. You know, August meeting. Not, we can, this we can, can just discuss it. Yeah. So I don't know. Because we would probably want to do it for the yeah, fall. Yeah, get them on as soon as possible fall, if yeah. you're going to do it. Yeah, they would, you know, we'd want to even maybe like, yeah, like have them right away. Yeah. So. Um, okay. Okay, good enough. Traffic on 9D. Just so I know we have five minutes okay. on the tape. For your two hour Okay. And then are we going to change tapes? Well, let's finish in five minutes. Oh, we're almost done. Okay, <laughs> traffic on 90. Um, traffic on 90. So this has been a kind of a conversation, an ongoing conversation. I don't know if everyone's privy to it, but um, we have all dealt with very publicly the traffic issues on Mountain Avenue, and I think we've come to some good um, solutions. solutions. So there's now a conversation around the traffic on 9D in Craigside, that intersection mm -hmm. where there's the crossing guard. Um, a, one community member has reached out a couple of times saying that you know he feels like it's a dangerous intersection, people don't stop for the crossing guard, can the school, should the school 
do anything about it. He's also not just reached out to the school, but to um, the Cold Spring mayor, the town supervisor. So he understands that this is a, a group, in, you know, a group effort. Um, and as a result, uh, Deputy Piazza did a little sweep around down there, check it out, see if he thinks that it's dangerous. And uh, I don't know if you want to share your assessment. On a personal note, I cross that intersection on foot with small children twice a day, every day. Um, I don't know. I mean, people certainly could be a little bit more responsive to the crossing guard, but I do think our crossing guard does a good job, and I do think they do stop. Like, it, to me, it's been a manageable situation, but... Um, so really, this conversation started a year ago. Mm -hmm. um, this time last year, some concerns had come up from different citizens uh, in and around the same topic. So at the time, about this time to the end of last school year, I managed the intersection uh, for high school, middle school drop off, uh, 715 to 730, and then again elementary school. At that time, it seemed very apparent that we needed somebody there 715 to 730, but not for the elementary school. Uh, in that in that time slot, uh, the crossing guard is there. He continues to be there. Uh, he was happy to have additional support. Uh, he shared some stories, you know, from the past, um, but agreed that it was manageable. You know, especially the time where I wasn't necessarily out there for the elementary drop off. When this new school year started, we, you know, continued the commitment to be out there, seven fifteen to seven thirty for high school, and not for the elementary school. Um, in response to uh, some of these emails that we received, I went back out uh, for about two weeks uh, in that elementary school um, time frame, so really 8.30 to 8.45. Um, I, I, I'm not seeing what this particular person was reporting. Uh, in speaking with the crossing guard, he's not seeing what this particular person is reporting. Um, 90 is a heavily traveled road um, at that earlier time that's more drive time traffic commuter traffic um, luckily for us it's very straight and level both ways so there is a lot of opportunity to pick up if there's going to be an issue or something like that um, I think each and every one of us continues to drive around every day and see people talking on the cell phones and things like that crossing any road is inherently dangerous and need caution I think Tommy's doing a great job out there uh, with the addition of the new barrel, um, you know, to, to take up the shoulder, which does not allow the opportunity for anybody to use the shoulder, which had been a problem in the past where they would, you know, someone oh, that's going that's south. That's why that was there. I'm sorry. That's, that's so smart. Yeah. Uh, Tommy had that brought in, <laughs> you know, prior. Uh, like you said, if, if traffic, southbound traffic is looking to make the left into Craigside, yeah, people, like, people oh, would take the opportunity to drive on the shoulder, which is certainly which against is the law illegal. and Hello. incredibly dangerous at a school crossing mm -hmm. intersection. That barrel has prevented that. Um, yeah. I, I think the situation is very manageable. Uh, Cold Spring PD has been fantastic. They are out there when they can be, um, you know, highly visible, just like when I was out there with the truck, highly visible. I, I think we've made good efforts out there, and, and I'm just not seeing... What, what this particular person has reported. And Dave Miranda has been supporting additional support at that time, and he's been asking the Cold Spring mm -hmm. Police to mm -hmm. be part of that. Um, okay, so it sounds like it's under control. I think so. Okay, very good. Okay, and I just would like to add one more thing before we end. Um, I just like to uh, let you know that we're at the point that um, we're going to be getting the committees together for the middle school principal um, interview. We have four finalists that are going to be coming through committee, um, all very different. And they're, they're, it's going to be interesting because we have very talented candidates that have come forth in, in many different ways. So um, we are just determining, we're hoping to do it a week from Thursday. Um, if everybody will probably start as we did um, the last time around lunchtime, have lunch, talk a little bit before the candidates come in, and then have one to five o'clock, the candidates would co be coming through, and then um, just a closing session before we, we break. So we're talking about May 25th? Yes, it's... Thursday, May yep. 25th. Mm -hmm. And so we are at that point, so I just wanted to let you know. So, um, 
Once you have the confirmed dates, we as a board should decide if any of us are available to be there. Um, I'm giving a soft probably right now. Um, but, you know, we'll have that conversation last time around when um, with the high school principal, we had um, a, a, an adult committee of teachers and parents and then a student committee. And we had two of us were on the adult committee and one of us were on, was on the um, student committee, right? Um, there, there has been a request, though, to divide the parent committee and the teacher committee. Okay, so there might be two separate committees for grown-ups. Mm -hmm. three, three committees and then one for students. I think that kind of makes sense. I mean, I can see why. Yeah. And then we would ultimately, like, we would... And then you would have, you would interview the finalist or the finalists, depending on what was recommended. And yeah, the full board would still have the opportunity. We would still do sure. a final, an interview with them, for sure. But if anybody wants to serve on the com interviewing committee, um, there's opportunity for that. And there's, it looks, sounds like there's going to be enough committees that if all of us wanted to serve on, a, on one of those committees, we could. There wouldn't be a quorum. So there, should, there isn't really a limit. So just whoever wants to can. Can. So we need to accept the uh, results officially. Yes. The recommended action is that the Board of Education accepts the results of the annual district meeting, budget vote, and trustee vote for Tuesday, May 16th, 2017, as presented. Uh, can I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. All right. Hit it. Do you need to? Aye. No. Oh, we're going to all those, and we don't, you don't need to roll call or any of that? No. Okay. okay. Um, any discussion besides woohoo? <laughs> <laughs> all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, that was easy. Um, I'd like to make a motion. Is there any communication from the public? <laughs> no? I'd like to make a motion to go in executive session to discuss the employment history of a particular individual. I'll second it. <coughs> All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Very good.